And it's my pleasure to sort of introduce, I don't need to really introduce in detail, uh, Russell Roberts. Um, his details are in the program, but many of you know Russell very, very well, I'm sure. One of the major areas of action for us in the last couple of years has clearly been around COVID and its impact on people with major mental illness. And Russell's going to talk to us about the issue of vaccination and the global call to action. Thank you, Russell. Good morning, everyone. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the uh, land on which we're speaking and thank Uncle John for his uh, introduction and pay respect to Uncle John and the other elders uh, uh, current, uh, emerging and uh, in the past. Um, I've come in at short notice uh, because, uh, Ruth, because of the election and Ruth Wine wasn't able to speak. So uh, I thought I was going to have the B team today. But as it turns out, we've got problems with Professor David Castle. So now, in fact, I'm the C team. So it's just getting worse and worse. So um, we'll see how we go. Um, really, I wanted to think through, because it's been on our mind, this thing for a little while, uh, COVID and what lessons have we learned from COVID related to the physical health people living with mental illness? But firstly, I just want to say, what lessons have you learned from COVID? Not a rhetorical question, yell something out. What have you learned from COVID? What has COVID taught you about life or things or health services or whatever? Yell it out loud. Nothing? Come on. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Health, services health services are underfunded. Thanks. Up here. Slow down. Yep. Yes. Legislation not fit for purpose. Keep going. Walk, don't run. <laughs> Walk, right, run. Yes. As someone here, I think, put the hand up. What's that? Sorry. Don't take life for granted. Thank you. Other. What was that? Sorry. Not a race. Thank you. Misinformation. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Faye. Yes, it's the joy of not travelling to meetings and stuff all the time. Yes. We all need to be connected. Thank you. Yes, and we all are connected, whether we know it or not. Yes, thank you. Something with compassion? Okay, great. Yeah. And Zoom, and I, I learned this new phrase, you are on mute. Uh, <laughs> um, if someone invents that automatic unmuting, they will make a million dollars. So there you go, just an idea. Um, I'm going to share with you some of my thoughts about what we've learned about uh, COVID-19 and some around equally well on our journey. Um, and I was going to ask the person for the next slide, but I've got the clicker. Um, what we did learn and was re-emphasised the people living with mental illness are vulnerable. But we, we know this is equally well, but the research overwhelming. There was so much great research in Australia internationally that, in fact, people with, living with mental illness were more vulnerable, more likely to be infected with COVID-19, more likely to suffer serious illness, more likely to be hospitalised and more likely to die. So this is just a reflection of our overall issue and, and some of the... Um, uh, systems and uh, processes are really a reflection of what's happening generally in physical health as well. Um, the thing that we had to do, of course, um, the other thing we notice is that um, prevention pays. You know, uh, preventing uh, the contagion and the illness. And there's some examples here. Uh, and we didn't do so well at that, quite frankly. We didn't do so well at look, keeping people safe, the quarantine facilities and vaccinations and all of those things. But you know, just for flu, the $60 flu vaccination, and, and at six times the rate. Uh, people with mental illness are hospitalised at six times the rate of the rest of the population for flu. Not COVID, just the general flu. So I'm looking ahead. Um, a $60 vaccination using the Independent Hospitals Pricing Authority guidelines, it's roughly $2,000 a night. For a hospital bed. People with mental illness had six times the rate of hospitalisation by the common flu. And the same thing was for COVID. COVID vaccination, I'm going to go, not going to go there because it's been complicated, but with the flu it's a certain issue. And Mal talked about the costs of that that we could prevent. $15 billion every single year. I don't know how many submarines that will buy us, but one or two, um, uh, simply by preventing this. 
And most of these things are preventable. Um, there's other areas that COVID's taught us about. Cancer. 16 people a day living mental illness die prematurely of cancer. If that group had the same rate as the general population, it would be 1.78 people per day. We've got to get down to that same level and prevent that. Not only does it pay financially, it pays in human, in human life, in human suffering and productivity and quality of life. Prevention pays across all those domains. Um, and so it's so important. COVID, we've learnt this. Flu, we've learnt this. Well, it's for everything else as well, cancer and cardiovascular disease as well. It also requires a national policy response. We need to sort of be organised at the national level. And we did have that. The Commission jumped, I'm not allowed to mention that name, I'm not sure, given the caretaking mode. Uh, a certain agency jumped out of the box early and did some work with a, a, an Australian pandemic uh, mental health response plan. Um, the uh, certain other agency, central agency, medical agency, also advocated to make sure that people living with mental illness were a priority for COVID vaccination, a priority group. I think the risk was equivalent to 65 years plus, so that the risk for people living with mental illness was the same as 65 year old plus risk. Um, and through some collective action in the International Collaborative Network and the strength through different, different countries, we in fact influenced the CDC's priority listing rate, the Centre for Diseases Control in the US, which were lagging November, that was just last November, we managed, we launched the declaration in October, we started to pressure internationally across a number of countries to our US counterparts to pressure the CDC to say, listen, this evidence is overwhelming, why are you not paying attention to it? That's a whole is another issue of why they don't pay attention to evidence about mental illness Im impacts than they do to everything else. So we've learned about that, it's important. We've got some pieces missing some national policy responses missing. Heart disease, the biggest killer, the, the thing that kills people more than anything in terms of physical health and mental illness. New Zealand has a policy framework for this in terms of primary care that the government's adopted. We're not there yet. We do, I think we need a state and national response to that. And there's some work there I think that the Mitchell Institute hopefully will lead as well. Cancer. A cancer response, a national policy for prioritising and systematising our approach to cancer screening, detection, prevention, early intervention and treatment, equality of treatment. We don't want anything special, we just want to get the same level as everybody else. The same for diabetes. Now there's some exciting things happening in this way, which I think the Austra Diabetes Association of Australia, I think will be leading some work here over the next 12 months. There's some exciting announcements in this response and there's some great people who'll be working there who are great friends of Equally Well. And I'm looking forward to that, uh, the slow reveal at our next conference uh, when we have it. Policy is not enough. It requires affirmative action. You know, policy alone is not sufficient. Great to have the policy framework, but that's just a platform, really, to do something. Do something. You know, we need to operationalise that at the service level. What does that mean? Where are the resources? How are we going to do it? How are we going to coordinate it? All of these things happen. And it needs to be person-centred. That's what we learned from COVID. Not service-centred. Mental health services and health services and primary health services, they're foreign lands. They're there for the convenience of the service providers. And it's very comfortable for them because they're all in one place and everyone comes to you. But really, we need to be person-centred to think go into people's territory where they're comfortable. And we really did learn that to access marginalised group in COVID, we had to reach out to that. And we had to sort of, uh, well, and be creative. And partnership really works. There's a great example in Dubbo where the primary care uh, uh, director is an Aboriginal man. Wonderful partnership there with the AMS, the health service, and the mental health services and primary health care, working together to identify at-risk people for COVID, but then partnering and say, well, how are you going with other parts of your life? How are you going with your physical checkup? How are you going with this and, and the other? How are you going with primary care generally? How are you going with accessing services? So taking that opportunity to identify, go out and reach and focus on the person. And only with that partnership, which is needed in terms of having that legitimacy and getting in the door and being trusted as, as someone uh, who can do that. Also partnership with consumers, carers, clinicians and finance. We've got to work together. 
as Mao said, that's the DNA of Equally Well. We are equal as contributors. Consumers, lived experience, clinicians, the chief psychiatrist, everyone, the policy makers, the coups, the chief operational officers, the finance officers, we are all equal and we all have a unique contribution to make. But we need one another to do it properly. We can't do it by ourselves. So partnership, we're better together. And we noticed that with the global call for vaccine equity, which we led uh, here. And that, that's, you can't see it, but there's some, this, uh, a, a press release in Belgium and India. And we did that internationally. You can go on the website, you can still sign up to that. And we were able to influence policy in Australia and in the US and in the UK. And we're still working on that. Uh, we, we really influenced policy around COVID. Uh, but we're also now starting to influence policy about other vaccinations, about people having ability and e equity of access to vaccinations. Not mandate it, just have the same opportunity as everyone else. How hard is that? It's bloody hard. Um, it requires leadership. What is a leader? A leader is an agentic interaction which influences others to follow. If you suggest something and others follow, you are a leader. It can be a chief medical officer, it can be a director of a service, it can be a CEO who says, we're going to do this and we can do it properly, we're going to do it well, and this is what it's going to look like. Here's our values, here's our capacity, here's the finance, we're going to do it. But you know, it can be a clinician or it can be a consumer to say, this is not good enough. I'm being treated rubbish here. I should be treated as a person. Don't overlook me and focus on my diagnosis. That person who influences the service to change is a leader. The service has been influenced in that direction. We're all leaders. Every time we stand up and advocate for this and, and we influence our organisation or our constellation in one way, we are leaders and it requires leadership at all levels. Um, Vicky Langan, I'm going to put you on the spot. I want you to yell out, because it needs, this needs a, a foreign lilt, an accent, this word. How would you say the word grand? grand. Can you just say this again? <laughs> out loud. Grand. grand. See, that sounds far better than what I say, grand. But we're doing a grand thing, you know. And I just checked the dictionary last night. And what is grand? How do you say it again, Vicky? Grand. Sorry, am I getting into racial vilification here? Uh, can I just say, you could talk, anyone with that little, I just listen to all day, it's just wonderful. Um, grand means a lot of things. It means magnificent and imposing in size or appearance. It's large, it's of high rank and dignified, is one definition in the Oxford Dictionary. It's the largest and most important thing of its type. It's very good and enjoyable. Um, and finally, the, the normal other definition of it is grand, it's generational. Um, so this is a grand, we are doing a grand thing. This is a massive issue that we're tackling. We're talking uh, 23,000 people per annum who die prematurely. Um, now, at least half, maybe more, of those deaths are preventable. And when we just think of the top 10 causes of death, it's 11,300 every year, which is 30 a day or 60 a day for all causes. They're not all preventable. It's a grand scope of works. How are we going to tackle this? And Mao talked about this a bit. It's, it's multi-dimensional, um, but we've also got a Grand Prix, I don't know if there's anybody of a French accent here, but a Grand Prix um, of barriers, of stigma, of structural discrimination, of resource constraints, of resistance, of organisational capacity. Some organisations would love to do it, but they just, quite frankly, they couldn't organise their way out of a wet paper bag. And that's, that's a problem when we're trying to institute organisational change. Um, and also in COVID, the constantly changing service environment. Things like today. The only reason I'm here is because of the constantly changing, and you might say, curse COVID, but the only reason I'm here is because of the constantly changing service environment in that presenters haven't been able to come. Um, now we're confronted with that through COVID almost weekly, changes of laws, changes of public health uh, uh, orders and stuff like that, uh, and, and people not being able to attend, people calling in sick, people being vulnerable, having to wear PPE, not having to wear PPE. So the service environment is constantly changing and we're having to act within that. It's a real challenge. It's a grand prix of barriers. Um, but the other thing in grand, you know, honourable and dignified thing, 
I'm just about, I always, sorry, every time we talk about this story, I get a bit cut up. It's, we, we're changing lives, you know. We changed one person's life, we've transformed it. I, I want to talk about a story of someone in a mental health service, a country mental health service, that um, a small mental health service, we're going to have a go with equally well, we're going to have someone focus on physical health. And we can do that. And they did that. They picked up someone who was unwell, a lot, chronic illness, losing their hair. Uh, and they said, what's going on here? Maybe this is some endocrinology, uh, endocrinology, endro, con, say it for me please, Mark. <laughs> endocrine. I was going to go logical. Endocrine disorder. And so they looked at that. Maybe it's some early stage of cancer. Uh, and so this person, this equally well person, and this small team decided that they'd de dedicate to this role, started to look into it. Did all these diagnoses. It turned out she was malnourished. Malnourished. Ten years of chronic disease, ten years of being in contact with mental health services, shame on us. Meet with a dietitian, fix up that health, fantastic impact. One, one life with a family and children and siblings and parents transformed it. That's a grand impact. You know how many we're we doing of these? Thousands. We're doing thousands a day. We're having a grand impact. This is a grand, dignified thing we're doing. It's also grand in that what we're doing is grand. Here, everyone, should, we share the same agenda. We have grand aspirations. We have grand hopes and we have grand values. And there's an opportunity, I think, to grandstand one another. Um, we're doing some great research, world-leading research. We've got some fantastic partnerships, which we'll hear about in this conference. And we've got some awesome innovations. And that's what this conference is about. I've got to get a prop. I'm a man of, uh, I'm a man of many strengths and weaknesses, as my wife would say. Uh, <clears throat> this might be seen as one of my uh, weaknesses. We have, we, I think that for us, this is an opportunity for appreciative listening. One of our colleagues in Belgium talked about this, is to appreciate the challenges that we're having to address, appreciate the challenge the work that we're doing, and not be critical, but listen and understand and appreciate the great work we're doing. Sure, it's and, and exhort people to do better, but really appreciate people say, you're having a go, but also to encourage and to celebrate. When we have wins and success, to celebrate that. And I love this. I sat down with my family last Saturday to watch the Adelaide Crows women win their third premiership out of six, and they celebrate. They celebrate success, and I think we need to do that here as well, is when we make it a success and we win something, to celebrate, to acknowledge and celebrate together. Um, I really hope that that's the tone of our conference, that we're doing a grand thing, and that's what we've learned, I think, from COVID. Thanks.